Hello, everyone. Welcome to Meet the Experts. I'm Katie Wolfson, a science education specialist with the UCAR Center for Science Education at the National Center for Atmospheric Research. And we are so excited to have folks joining us today from multiple places across Colorado and Florida today. Thank you so much for joining us for Meet the Experts. Uh, Meet the Experts, if this is your first time here, is a monthly Q&A program with different experts here at the National Center for Atmospheric Research. So we have so many different jobs here. It's one of my favorite things about working here. We have everything from scientists to engineers to programmers uh, to chefs to artists to teachers. So we have lots of different careers here at the National Center for Atmospheric Research. And today we have a special expert to talk to you today about hurricanes. Uh, so before we get into that and I introduce our expert and bring them on, I just wanted to cover a few housekeeping things. So if you need anything at all during the program, please type that in the chat and I will be watching that. So if you need any tech support, have trouble hearing us, anything like that, please let us know. Um, and then also if you have any questions at any point during the program. So we'll take questions throughout if you have them based on something you see or you hear. And also we'll have some time for questions at the end. We have about 40 minutes today to talk to our expert. So we're very excited to hear from her as well as to answer your questions. I love getting to connect students from all over the world to our experts here at the National Center for Atmospheric Research. So with that, I am going to go ahead and bring on our expert today. Today we are talking to Rosie Marios Barrios, who is a hurricane scientist with the NCAR Mesoscale and Microscale Meteorology Lab. So Rosimar, can you hear us? I can hear you. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, thanks so much for coming. So, Rosimar, um, I know we have a lot to cover today, and so I was curious if you could maybe start to kick us off with telling us a little bit about what kind of path did you take? How did you become a hurricane scientist? Yes, of course. Um, so, I grew up in Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico is a small island in the Caribbean. It's a beautiful island. Um, it feels like summer every day. <laughs> and as it is in the Caribbean, it is exposed to hurricanes. So growing up, I thought of Puerto Rico as being located in the middle of Hurricane Highway. So we're going to see that this map is going to get all cluttered. So the map, the island of Puerto Rico is still there. You cannot see it because there's so many lines covering it. And all of those lines are essentially the paths that hurricanes had followed through history. So growing up, I got to experience some of these hurricanes. And every time that we had a hurricane nearby or a hurricane coming to the island, I was always wondering why couldn't the meteorologist tell us for sure if the hurricane was going to come or if how strong it was going to be. Um, say the equivalent, if you are thinking like, why can't the meteorologist today tell me whether it's going to rain or not, <laughs> right? So that curiosity kind of sparked my interest in meteorology. Um, for me, specifically trying to understand why we couldn't predict hurricanes so well. So I made it my goal to become a meteorologist and go on TV and give the best and most perfect forecast. Um, about hurricanes, but it turns out that as I went through my studies, I realized that the science of weather prediction is very, very complex, very complicated. Also standing in front of the camera and giving a weather forecast was very uh, difficult. And so I got to try it a little bit, but then I did summer internships and I realized that I liked a lot more doing the work behind the scenes, writing computer code and doing research that enable us to improve the tools that weather forecasters use to predict hurricanes. So I went from growing up in Puerto Rico, being very interested in hurricanes. And then as I like to show in a map, I kind of followed a hurricane track by going from Puerto Rico. Uh, then I moved to the United States to um, get my graduate education in atmospheric sciences. And now I live in the state of Colorado in Boulder, where I work as a hurricane scientist and the National Center for Atmospheric Research. So in this place that you can see in this picture, um, there's lots of scientists working on lots of different problems regarding weather, climate and everything in between. In my case, I live here studying hurricanes. 
but now in Colorado, we don't get to experience hurricanes. We get to experience other kinds of weather. So I'd like to pause here and I want to get to know the audience as well. So I want to ask for those of you who are tuning in today, uh, do you experience hurricanes where you live? Or if you don't experience hurricanes, what kind of exciting or perhaps frightening weather do you experience where you live? You can type your answers in the chat. So again, do you experience hurricanes where you live? Or uh, if you don't experience hurricanes, what kind of weather do you experience from day to day? And while the answers are coming in the chat, I will tell you briefly that as a scientist, my work is mostly focused on understanding how hurricanes form, how they become very strong, how they produce a lot of rainfall, and also how they may change in light of our changing climate. So let's see, do we have any answers coming in through the chat? I don't quite see any answers yet, but I'm guessing they might be typing in there. So let us know if you experience hurricanes where you live or other types of weather that are exciting or scary. Um, or maybe in places you've lived in the past, maybe you've had hurricanes if you lived somewhere else before. So I knew, I know I live here in Colorado now, so um, I don't have any hurricanes that I'm dealing with, but I did grow up in Southern Louisiana where we definitely had hurricanes coming through um, each time. And oh, one of our schools says no hurricanes here in Denver, but wind and snow and blizzards are some of those. Oh, <laughs> Hello to our friends very close us in Denver. <laughs> yes, definitely. We don't have hurricanes here. Uh, but yes, very true. Wind, storms, uh, snowstorms. And yeah, for those of us who live near to the mountains, wildfires as well. All right. Oh, and those of those people who live very far in the eastern corner of the Colorado state, they get to experience tornadoes as well in the summer. All right, thank you for typing in your answers. So I'm going to go ahead now and tell you a little bit about hurricanes. Then I'll tell you about how I study hurricanes and I'll finish up by telling you how climate change may affect hurricanes. So what is a hurricane? A hurricane is a system of rotating clouds and these clouds rotate around a center of low pressure. That center is known as the hurricane eye. As you can see in the satellite image, the hurricane eye has relatively no clouds and conditions are calm. But as we move away from the eye, we see lots and lots of clouds that's associated with lots and lots of rainfall and also very strong hurricane, very strong winds. So hurricanes form over ocean waters. And as we will see in the next map, uh, they not only happen on this side of the world, they also happen uh, all around the world, and they get different names depending on where they happen. So broadly speaking, hurricanes are part of the family known as tropical cyclones, and they are named tropical because they happen over tropical waters that are very warm and close to the equator. The regions that are shaded here in green, in orange, sorry, they are the regions where we usually see hurricane formation in the summer months. So her, the tropical cyclones on this side of the world uh, in America is known as hurricanes, but over Asia, people know them as typhoons and over Australia and the Southern hemisphere, they're simply known as cyclones. Regardless of the name they get, they are the same phenomena. They just get different names depending on where we are in the world. So hurricanes form on those um, orange regions. And you may be wondering what's so special about those orange regions. Well, it turns out that for a hurricane to form, we need some basic conditions. And it's almost like baking. When you bake, you need your list of ingredients and you also need the list of steps that you need to follow to uh, bake, whether it's a cookie, a cake or whatever you're baking, right? So for a hurricane to form, we also need some basic ingredients. And those ingredients are warm ocean temperatures, lots of water vapor, weak wind currents, and also rotation. So all of these four conditions need to be in place for a hurricane to form. Now, the steps that a hurricane needs to follow or the atmosphere needs to follow in order to produce a hurricane, those steps are less known. So in the satellite image that you will see now, you can see what scientists kind of understand what the 
main mechanisms is. So we start with just random clouds happening here and there, everywhere, popping in here and there. Now you're going to see that they start organizing around a center and they start rotating. And so this is kind of like the basic sequence of events, but the precise steps, the details that happened, and why do some systems begin from these systems of clouds and they're able to organize into a hurricane versus not all, all systems of clouds are able to organize. Those are some very important questions that scientists like me are still trying to wonder about. Now, this is how hurricanes form. Then hurricanes can go on and extract energy from the ocean and they can become very powerful. So how do we know how strong a hurricane is? Hurricanes happen mostly over the oceans, so we can. it's very difficult for us to measure things over the ocean. So instead, we use very powerful airplanes. They are known as the hurricane hunter aircraft and the people that fly on board them, they are known as the hurricane hunters. And they go on and fly into the hurricane they launch instruments and they also have some radars on board and with all of those instruments they can measure how strong the winds are and depending on how strong the winds are then that information is being used by the hurricane forecasters to tell us this hurricane is a category one category two category three or four or five and those categories are given mostly or only based on how strong the winds are for example, this table is telling us that category one hurricanes are um, associated with strong winds between 74 to 90 mi 95 miles per hour. If you're wondering how fast that is, here in the uh, state of Colorado, for example, as the fastest we can go, I think it's 70 miles per hour on the highway, and we go very fast, right? That allows us to go very fast from one place to another. They imagine that hurricanes have winds that spin, like they blow much faster than we can go, than the fastest we can go on the highways. So the winds are blowing very, very fast, faster than we can go on a highway. So very strong winds. And it's no wonder that because of those very strong winds, hurricanes can be very destructive. So let's talk then about the effects of hurricanes. So I mentioned the winds, they're very strong. And once those winds encounter, uh, structures such as houses and buildings they can cause a lot of destruction especially if the structures are weak um, here's the picture for example showing a lot of damage that happened in the bahamas during hurricane dorian a couple of years ago but hurricanes are also associated with lots of rainfall and that rainfall once it falls and it accumulates in the rivers and the roads it can create flooding and here's a picture showing an example of actually a tropical storm so it was not quite a hurricane yet it was a tropical cyclone that was about to become a hurricane but it brought so much rainfall to the island of dominica that the rainfall accumulated and the river brushed away the road other effects of hurricane include storm surge so as a hurricane approaches land its strong winds can push the water from the ocean inland and it can create inundation like we see in that picture and there are other effects that may be indirect. For example, the very moist conditions and very heavy weight of water can cause landslides in islands and other regions around the world where hurricanes make landfall and there are mountains. So we're talking about meet the experts, but now you all have become experts in hurricanes because I've given you the information about how hurricanes form, how we know how strong they are, and what are some of the effects. So I'd like to ask you to answer a trivia question. And I promise you that there is no grading happening. <laughs> uh, so no worries about the answer. Please, I would like to know if you can enter in the chat, what part of a hurricane causes the most damage? What part do you think of a hurricane causes the most damage? And here are your options that you can type in the chat. It's either wind, water, landslides, or sharknadoes. <laughs> so feel free to type A, B, C, or D on the chat or type the, the full word. Or if you think it's some other part that we're not listing here, feel free to type it again as well. Um, so let's see, what part of a hurricane causes the most damage? 
Mm, let's see. Uh, waiting for some answers in the chat. Is it wind that causes the most damage? B, water? C, landslides? Or D, sharknadoes? I'm definitely worried about those sharknadoes here in Colorado, Rosemar. I don't know about you. Thankfully, they don't exist. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, we're going to go ahead and type those in if you have a guess. Uh, here we go. We got a few votes in here. It looks like people are all voting for A, for wind as being the causing the most damage from hurricanes. What do you think, Rosemar? That's an excellent answer. Uh, we all think that wind is the part that causes the most damage because, of course, hurricanes are known for their very strong winds. But it turns out that it's water, not wind, that causes the most damage and fatalities during a hurricane. So here we have just a pie chart that shows the percentage of uh, U.S fatalities that happened in the United States due to the hurricane, and they are categorized whether they happen during storm surge, rain, wind, tornado, etc. You see lots of blue and all of that is water. Whether it's storm surge, rain, or flood, uh, the very powerful effect of water can cause a lot of damage during a hurricane, and it turns out that that is what causes the most um, deaths and, love and fatalities in the U.S. So, whether we're talking about a category one or a category five hurricane, they are both very strong wind producers, but they can also both have lots and lots of water associated with them. And that's not uh, considered in the category. That's why whether it's a category one or a category five hurricane, we need to take them very seriously. So I told you about hurricanes. Now I want to tell you a little bit about how do I study hurricanes? Well, as a scientist, I like to do experiments, right? I like to know how hurricanes evolve, but I also would like to know how would they evolve had conditions been different. For example, what if we have warmer ocean temperatures in the future? What would happen to hurricanes? Well, if I was a biologist or a chemist, perhaps I would have a lab where I could do some experiments and get some immediate results. As a hurricane scientist, I don't get that lab because I only have the one atmosphere. So instead, I use supercomputers to create a virtual lab. So a supercomputer is just this, as the name suggests, is this big, big, big computer with lots of power. Uh, the supercomputer that we have currently can is equivalent to having 34,000 different laptops connected together. Imagine the amount of power that that supercomputer has, right? So with that supercomputer, what I can do is create a virtual laboratory. Essentially, I have a lot of computer code that tells the computer, here are the equations that describe the atmosphere. Here is a hurricane. Here's the ocean temperature. Here's the humidity. What would that hurricane do? Um, how would it evolve? And that gives me a wealth of data that I can analyze to study hurricanes. For example, I'm going to show you a video here where I have created this laboratory. It's a hypothetical world, like our world, the same size, except I have removed all the continents. And perhaps you're wondering, why would you like to remove the continents if hurricanes affect the continents? And also, I have removed islands, every piece of land. Well, doing so allows me to study how hurricanes evolve all the way from their formation to their strengthening, all the way to when they weaken and disappear. And that is the beauty of this work, is that I get essentially a laboratory. You can see, for example, right now we're zooming in on a group of clouds. They organize and they form into a hurricane. Right now we can clearly see the hurricane and the hurricane eye. And as the hurricane keeps moving, it actually encounters cool waters and it, it dissipates. Right, it loses its shape of a hurricane. So this kind of work allows me to go into the model and then uh, research essentially how did that hurricane form, what kind of sequence of steps did it follow, what were the atmospheric conditions, and what kind of impacts could have that hurricane brought had there been land. Would it have br brought like several inches of rain or tens of inches of rain? How strong would the winds be? 
So with this uh, lab, I'm able to answer lots of those questions. But I also get to go into the real atmosphere and I get to show you a couple of pictures. I get to go into the real lab, which is the atmosphere. And for that, I fly in very powerful and a very equipped aircraft, like the one you're seeing there. These airplanes have lots of instruments and amongst those instruments, we have something called a drop zone, which you will see shortly. Here is a drop zone. It's a weather sensor. So it's a small instrument. As you can see, it has a parachute because it's launched from the airplane. And as the drop zone is falling, the parachute opens and then it allows the drop zone to slowly, slowly descend. And it we turn the drop zone around, you can see that it has an instrument, actually many instruments in there, many sensors um, that are interconnected. And that white um, line on the right is, the, is where the sensors are that can measure how much water vapor there is, how cool or warm the temperature of the atmosphere is, and also how heavy the air is. That's the atmospheric pressure. So those instruments are launched and that with those sensors, the information is transmitted to us here it to, in, in our computers. And we can use that information and analyze it as well to understand how were, how was the atmosphere behaving when a hurricane formed or when it became very strong. And I also get to use other instruments. For example, um, I also get to launch weather balloons. You're going to get to see a cool video in a minute. Um, where we launch a weather balloon from land. And this cannot be done during a hurricane. As you will see, there is a big, big balloon. It's attached to a parachute. And also as it's being launched and it starts rising, it's pulling with it a small sensor. The sensor is very, very similar to what you just saw with the drop zone. And it can measure again the water vapor, the temperature, as well as how heavy the atmosphere is. And depending on the motion of the balloon, then it can also measure the winds. So launching these weather balloons during hurricanes would be extremely dangerous. That's why we don't do it. Instead, we go on aircraft where we can be safe, and then we launch the drop zones from there. So this is a little bit about my work on hurricanes. Uh, I'm also very interested in the topic of climate change and how hurricanes are affected um, with climate change. And I'll tell you right away that some of these questions are very important, but also very difficult to answer. And us scientists, we don't have all the answers. So if any of you would like to become a hurricane scientist, trust me that you'll have uh, plenty of questions to, to tackle. For example, we're wondering about how does climate change impact hurricanes? And many people would like to know if there will be more hurricanes or if they will be stronger. And it turns out that we don't have all the answers yet, but we do have some hypotheses for some um, possibilities. So hypothesis is something we think might happen. For example, we believe that we may see stronger hurricanes. As I mentioned before, hurricanes extract their energy from the ocean. So if our climate continues to change and the ocean temperatures continues to rise, then hurricanes can extract a lot more energy and can become very strong very fast. As an example here, you're looking at a satellite image of Hurricane Laura, which went from being just a group of clouds to a very powerful Category 4 hurricane in a day. And unfortunately, this may be the scenario that we may see in the future with a lot more Category 4s and Category 5s hurricanes. But as you may remember, wind is not the only effect of hurricanes. We also have hurricane rainfall. And it turns out that another possible impact of climate change is more hurricane rainfall and floods. As the atmosphere warms, it can hold more and more and more water droplets. And those water droplets can create lots more clouds and lots more rain that may fall and cause flooding. And related to this, we may also see elevated risk of storm surge. So as the ocean temperatures rise and the sea level rise, we may see storm surge essentially what I mentioned before and what we will see in the next slide, which is that as the hurricane approaches land, the winds associated with the hurricane start pushing that water inland. And you will see that in this 
a case where we're just showing animation, the water became so far inland and with so much strength that it it destroyed the house. And so in the future, if our ocean waters continue to become uh, warmer and the sea level continues to rise, the very powerful hurricanes may be able to push even more water inland than they do nowadays. So these are some of the possibilities. I would like to tackle some of these questions and would like to um, study them. And it turns out that just in the next new year, our institution is going to get a new supercomputer. Here's the picture that we just got two days ago of the supercomputer being installed. It's a very exciting time because this supercomputer will be very powerful and I will use it to do some experiments in which I say, okay, the ocean temperatures have risen by four degrees. Can you tell me what kind of impact would that have on the hurricanes? Will they be stronger? Will they have more rainfall? Will they cause more impacts due to wind or rain? And some, some answers to these questions are very, very important because I can pass those answers on to the hurricane uh, specialists, the hurricane uh, forecasters who can prepare to predict those impacts due to hurricanes, but also that information can be passed on to city planners and um, government officials in order to prepare the, uh, their communities to build structure, structures that can be prepared to resist the very strong impacts of hurricanes now and in the future. So that's all I wanted to cover from my part. Now I would love to answer any questions that you may all have whether it be about hurricanes or about my career or anything you'd like to know about um, hurricane and my work. <laughs> Thanks so much, Rosemar. Um, that was just fascinating and I'm super excited to see the, the brand new photos of the new supercomputer going in. Um, that's very mm -hmm. exciting. Um, that's in uh, Cheyenne, Wyoming, for those of you. We have an NCAR Wyoming Supercomputing Center. Um, in Cheyenne, Wyoming. So um, students feel free to type in the chat any of those questions coming in. Um, we would love to know what you're wondering, maybe some connections maybe that you're making to what you're learning about in class right now. Um, and if you're learning a bit about climate change or hurricanes or anything like that, we'd love to hear. Um, while we're waiting for those questions to come in, Rosemar, I'm curious, um, our scientists and experts here at NCAR come from all sorts of different backgrounds, all sorts of different career paths. Some of them discovered they were passionate about things in grad school or college or high school. Some knew from when they were in first grade that they wanted to study weather um, or become a computer programmer. So I'm curious for you, like when were you interested in science um, when you were in school um, or when did you kind of figure out that you wanted mm -hmm. to pursue hurricane science? Um, sure, yeah. So I, I actually didn't like my science classes. I remember being in seventh grade and telling my dad, like, I don't like this science class. And my dad was like, how come you say that? Science is so interesting. And I, my dad was not a scientist. He was a math teacher, but he, he thought science was interesting, but I disagreed back then. Um, in fact, I liked performing arts a lot better. Like I liked acting and dancing and um, writing and poetry. And I liked those things a lot more. Um, and so as I experienced the hurricanes and I thought I want to do something related to performing, but also my mind was very curious about hurricanes. I thought that uh, being a meteorologist, especially being on TV was the perfect combination because I could learn about hurricanes, I could give good forecasts, but also I could use that, you know, passion for the performing arts and, and the public speaking. But yeah, my career took me in a very different direction. And instead, like I, my love for math and computer code um, grew stronger over the years. And that's how I ended up becoming instead the person behind the scenes, the person that does the research uh, trying to improve uh, the models and the tools that we use for hurricane and weather prediction. Awesome. Well, I'm so glad that you discovered that and came to join us at NCAR. And I think that kind of bringing that creativity and art side, right, is super powerful in science and helps you probably in your job um, with all your creative thinking and um, planning for things. 
It uh, looks like we do have some questions starting to come in from our students. Thanks so much. Keep those coming. Uh, we have a question from our friends in Denver asking who names hurricanes? Oh, that's a good question. So um, it turns out that not hurricanes were not always named, uh, but um, long, long time ago, um, soldiers from around the world were writing letters to um, their relatives and whatnot. And that's how they started actually naming hurricanes in the past. Um, it was really like these soldiers far away from their homes that were naming the hurricanes on behalf of their loved ones. But as the um, history uh, progressed, uh, uh, it became very clear that naming the hurricanes actually created more awareness. So people started associating the, the okay, this hurricane in particular is named Alan or like Alex. And so it started creating a lot more awareness about what was happening. And so um, nowadays uh, there is an institution that um, they pick a set of names. There is actually six set of names. So they, one for each year. So every six years, the same list of names repeat, but that institution chooses the names and they make sure that they are, um, can be understood in multiple languages, that they don't mean anything offensive in any other language. And they also make sure that any hurricane that caused lots and lots of damage um, is removed from the list and it's substituted with a new name. Thanks so much. And I'm going to drop in the chat a link to the World Meteorological Organization's uh, website if you want to know more about what those different tropical cyclone names are in different parts of the world and get access to those lists and how they come up with it, too. Yeah, thank um, you. All right. We have another question in the chat of can there be a stronger hurricane than a Category 5? Oh, that's a very good question. So it turns out that um, some scientists are starting to wonder about that. So the category five hurricane ends with winds stronger than 155 miles per hour. But a couple of years ago, we observed several hurricanes that had winds of 200 miles per hour, which is well above the 155 that is set for category five. Apologies so, there, Rosie Meyer. For some reason, we got muted on accident there. So can you start that question from the top? Thanks yes, so much sure. for letting us know. Um, yes, so I, I was going to say that um, so far, like we we just stopped at Category 5. Anything that is stronger than 155 miles per hour gets labeled as a Category 5 hurricane. But um, in recent years, we've had very strong hurricanes. For example, Hurricane Patricia, which happened in the Eastern Pacific Ocean, it had winds stronger than 200 miles per hour, which is well above 155, right? So um, yeah, scientists are starting to wonder whether we need to add a category six or not. And so the answer there so far is that um, category five hurricanes are so rare to begin with that we're just stopping there. Um, there can be hurricanes that have very, very strong winds that could be considered its own category. But for now, we're going to remain with the strongest hurricanes are going to be category five hurricanes. All right. Thank you for those questions. Um, continue bringing those in. We have another question here. Of, do you get to travel for your work, Rosie Meyer? I do. Um, it's probably one of my favorite parts of my job. I get to travel for various reasons. So one of them is uh, what I showed you, right? Like going to fly in, in the aircraft, in, in the airplanes that go into hurricanes. Um, for that reason, we need to fly. We, we have to go to the places where hurricanes form and they don't happen here right now, right? They don't happen here in Colorado. So I have to fly whether it's to Florida or to Puerto Rico or to around the world. Like I, two months ago, I was just in Cabo Verde, which is an island in Africa. And I get to go to those places um, for work. I also get um, to travel in addition to traveling for collecting observations about hurricanes. I also get to do some travel to talk to other scientists. For example, we may gather once a year to just talk about hurricanes or we may gather 
uh, once a year to talk about any topic about weather, climate, and anything in between. And for those reasons, I also get to travel. So yes, lots of travel involved in, in my work, in my job. All right, and I think we have time for one more question. Uh, we have a question of what is your favorite part of your job? <laughs> Good question. Um, I think my favorite part of my job is like getting to discover. <laughs> like I may have an outstanding question. Like I may have a question about, for example, like how did X hurricane became so strong? And so uh, it takes a lot of time and effort to answer those questions. But once I have a question, it's so satisfying and so exciting. <laughs> so just manipulating the data and getting to discover things in the data and getting to answers to my questions. It's just, it, it's, it's both very exhausting because it takes lots of effort, but once it happens, just the part of discovery of um, discovering how something works or discovering how uh, a hurricane moves or how it produces rainfall. Um, that part of discovery is really my favorite part of my job. And I also mentioned the traveling. I, I must mention that, that getting to go to places, not only to see the atmosphere um, first person, first hand, but also as I travel, I get to meet other people and I get to experience other cultures. And I get to also see how those cultures experience the weather that I study. And so that is very exciting and very satisfying for me. Wonderful. Well, thank you so, so much, Rosemar. Thank you students for all of your questions and for taking the time to connect with us today. We had so much fun hearing from you. Um, and thank you, Rosemar, for taking the time to talk with us today and connect with us. I know I'll share with the students that Rosemar, after this, is on her way to go receive the Governor's Award for Outstanding Early Career Scientist today. So, um, so we're really <laughs> special to have such an amazing expert. And congratulations again, Rosemar. Thank you. <laughs> um, so thank you, everybody. Um, Rosemar, or do you have any final words you want to share with students before we sign off today? Oh, I just want to share with you that, you know, persevere. <laughs> um, the one word that I would um, advise my young self and any other person is to persevere. Um, whether is it that you dream to become a scientist or not, maybe you dream of becoming um, some other kind of profession or artist or whatever it is, just Remember that, um, persevere, keep trying, even if it doesn't seem like things are working your way, just keep trying. Trust me, there is a reward at the end. Awesome, and I'm seeing thanks in the chat. Also, someone says sweet cloud earrings. So <laughs> we'll have to find out where we can get some of those. Awesome. <laughs> Very cool. Um, I wanna invite everyone to um, please return um, next semester. So in the spring, we will be doing some more Meet the Experts with different experts. We haven't quite announced our list yet, so it's a little bit of a mystery still, but you can check our website because we'll be returning in February, 2023 uh, with Meet the Experts. We are planning on going behind the scenes with some supercomputers, learning about scientific teamwork, learning about about wildfires and more. So you can check our website, saya.ucar.edu, for our Meet the Experts offerings when those get posted in the very near, near future. And also follow us on social media um, for other programs and events. We are also, since we have some Colorado folks on, I will mention we are back open to the public again at the NCAR Mesa Lab. So you can come on and visit our visitor center for free, play in some clouds, see the scientists eating lunch, hanging out, walking between meetings. Um, so please, please come visit us. We would love to have you come visit us in Boulder. So thank you again, Rosimar. Thank you, students. And we will see you next time. Have a great day, everybody. Bye. Bye.